angry fans. Change of format today. I'm doing a video going home. Hence my ragged appearance. So what are we talking about today? Okay, I just wanted to sort of do a quick video to catch you up on the fact that uh, the private fees guide is now available and it's easier to explain this than it is to write to everyone. I have actually written to everyone. You should have got an email today, that is yesterday, that is Monday the 15th of May according to my own Fitbit and uh, basically it sort of explains a bit. Now first of all I have to tell you that most of the members renew on the 1st of June. Don't ask me why, that's just historically I think that was the coordinated date that we chose when we went over from monthly renewals to annual renewals. So, the other thing is that uh, HSBC won't let us do direct debit. Well, they will, they will, but it's just mind-numbingly problematic to try and get them to... Uh, I don't know where I'm going, by the way, so... We could go on some very interesting diversions. Yeah, so... If you pay by direct debit, then what will normally what, what would have happened was that you'd have got a letter saying, thank you very much, we're going to click your direct debit on or after 1st of June, you do not need to do anything. This year, that is not going to happen. We are not collecting any direct debits this year. This year, if you pay by direct debit, you will have to do something. You will have to choose another way of paying. Now, you've got two choices. You can either if you're the sort of person that likes to pay every year on a one-off basis, just in case you decide that you don't want to pay next year, then you can make a one-off payment. That's quite easy. If you want to set up some sort of, uh, you know, recurring direct debit type arrangement, oh, Google Play services stopped. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. If this doesn't work, then I'll just do it tomorrow on the way into work. But anyway, yeah, so, you'll, you'll, um, so you can't pay by direct debit this year. So, But you can set up a direct debit type arrangement with a recurring uh, payment through PayPal. PayPal is just our... Don't get hung up on the fact it's PayPal. They just happen to be our payment processor. It could be anybody. But... Um, you don't need a PayPal account. If you just want to make a payment, then you can just uh, go to your your um, the dentalfusion.org cl and click on your account and uh, log in. If you've forgotten your password, just say, I forgot my password, and it'll email you either your password or a link to reset your password. Then go to your account, and then you can either make a one-off payment with using your credit card or whatever. And... Um, if you want to, if you don't want to be doing with it every year, then set up a recurring payment. Now, if you set up a recurring payment, then you will have to open a, a PayPal account. But having said that, that's free of charge. So what you do is you just link your credit card or your debit card or whatever your business card to your PayPal account, and then um, it'll, every year it'll handle the recurring. Oh. G jumping a Jehoza fat. You can see what sort of a day I've had, can't you? I had no patients booked in today. And then all of a sudden, the day's full. I had a bloke in, did a very nice root treatment on his lower right five. I do all my root treatments by hand. I've got no mechanical aids whatsoever. And uh, fantastic, 23 millimeter lower right five. And uh, this was an endodontic re-root treatment, as uh, so many of his teeth and so many teeth are. And then another uh, woman who came in uh, with pain in the lower left sort of eight area, and said that uh, 
you know, this pain. I said to her, how bad is it? She said, it's eight, 8 out of 10. So, if you don't use a pain scale, you should use a pain scale. That's my tip of the day. A pain scale is great. You say on a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is the worst pain you can imagine, how bad is the pain? And you'll get three, broadly speaking, three responses. Some of the people are sort of take it realistic, seriously, and are sort of a bit intelligent. And they'll say, oh, I don't know, two or three or four or something. And then you get the real nutcases to say 11. Straight away they say, oh, it's 11. Oh, it's 11. And they're sort of tipping you off to the fact that they're not taking you very seriously and they might be a bit, you know, and um, then you get some like this lady that says oh, eight, and you say, well, you know, eight, eight out of ten, where ten is the being tortured, <laughs> while simultaneously having every bone in your body broken, while simultaneously being poisoned and set on fire, and that's your eight out of ten out, eight out, <laughs> out of ten. There you go. Oh yes, oh yes. So. The reason why the pain scale works is if someone says eight and then they come in again and they say oh that pain's still no better it's got you know it's it's getting worse doctor it's getting worse and you go okay well on a scale of 0 to 10 how bad would you say it is now and they say oh because they're stuck then aren't they because they've come in too high they've got no headroom you've got if you're sensible on this scale you've got to come in about five or six to give yourself a bit of have a chance to go up. So then what do they do? They either say eight, in which case you can say, oh well, that's good. It's no worse. Or they say nine or ten. But then that's it, you know, it starts starts to look a bit daft at that point when they say it's ten out of ten. In fact you can usually tell how much pain a patient is in. The whole point of the score is not really to judge how much pain they're in although obviously you know subjectively they they can tell you how much pain they're in but I don't know whether that necessarily makes a lot of difference to the treatment but it's really just to find out where they fit in this scheme of things you know are they able to access their own pain do they realize that mild toothache that they're not taking painkillers for and which kept them up woke them up once one night is not an eight. Is not an eight out of ten. You know, are they? What, what's their reasoning like? You know, what's their logical? Are they sort of rational? Um, the patients who are really in pain, you don't need to ask. The ones, the patients I've seen who are really in pain, came in with a two-litre bottle of cold water because that's the only thing that provides any relief. And they'll talk to you for about 30 seconds and then they'll just go completely quiet for a minute like they've had a fallen asleep and it's not that it's just they've had a wave of pain overcome them you know and, and they can't talk it's so bad that they can't talk and then they, they have a sip of water and carry on talking again now, with a patient like that, who's, who's obviously in that much pain, the best thing to do is just to give them, a, find out which tooth it is and just give them an ID block. So don't don't take a medical, I mean obviously I think you better take it like rudimentary medical history, but I mean in the cases I saw, I already knew the patient. So um, what they did was when they come in, you just say to them, look, hang on to your bottle of water. Before I say anything, I'm just gonna give you an ID block. And, uh, and then, once, once you've got rid of the pain, you can then take the history and decide, you know, to do the root treatment or whatever. I had a patient uh, once who I gave him a, an, an ID block. He's one of these people who's in a lot of pain. Gave him an ID block, and um, I don't forget we took a tooth out or started a root treatment on him or something in those days. These days we would do the entire root treatment, start to finish. But in those days we used to give them antibiotics. In fact, we uh, we had a script pad printed up um, in a dot matrix printer. We used to take all the staples out, run it through a dot matrix printer with a Moxel uh, caps, 250 milligrams, and uh, then put the staples back in. 
another one of my contributions towards efficiency in dentistry. And uh, yeah, so he rang up and uh, I said to him, what's the problem, you know? He said, I, I need to come back in. I said, well, why? He said, I want you to get me numb again. And I said, yeah, but what for? You know, what, what do you need doing? He said, nothing. He said, I just want another ID block. He said, I want, I just want He said, it's, I'm worried about how much pain I'm going to be in when it wears off. So can you uh, just do another one? And this bloke actually came in and uh, two or three hours after we did the first ID block, I, did, I just did another ID block on him and then he went home again. <laughs> oh dear. Those were the days. Anyway, she, uh, she, you know, she gave me all this, uh, this a massive great backstory to this. She's got a lower left, unerupted lower left wisdom tooth. And she's got no seven and no six down there. So she's convinced that she lost the seven and the six because the dentist misdiagnosed the pain from the eight, of course. She's been to see or at least two oral surgeons about it, apparently. Um, and they've told her that they, she shouldn't have it touched because one told her she shouldn't have it touched because uh, it's so deeply buried that if she had it out it'd probably break her jaw and the other one told her that uh, it was if it was giving her trouble then she should have it out and she can't understand how you know two oral surgeons could come up with two different opinions and um, She was worried about uh, having an anaesthetic because she was convinced that it would probably need a general anaesthetic and uh, as a result she would die, she would die under the anaesthetic and she said her wisdom teeth were like hand grenades or bombs, I think they're bombs, I've got three, she said, I've got three bombs in my jaw she said, they're like bombs and uh, what was the other thing, oh yeah when she had the upper left uh, wisdom tooth taken out um, she'd left it apparently so late that she was within two hours of dying according to the consultant oral surgeon who took the tooth out told her that if she'd left it two more hours this infection it would have killed her and yet she can't see the I recommended that she had this tooth out I told her that it was unlikely that she was going to die and, and or need a general anaesthetic and they're not really likely to break her jaw and if it was 8 out of 10 on the pain scale see hoist on her own petard that um, if it was me I would have the tooth out and I never say what she should do she should do I say if it was me this is what I would do so um, but then but then she started saying um, we took a um, well I tried to take an x-ray of this wisdom tooth bearing in mind it's a lower left eight and it's buried deep in the angle of her jawbone and and she's going oh, 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 because it's eight out of ten isn't it on the pain scale and she wants me to know it so I managed to get half the tooth on the x-ray she said why can't you get the whole tooth on the x-ray my previous dentist got the whole tooth on the x-ray how can you tell me what to do if you can't even see the whole tooth she said you can't really you can't really make a recommendation if you haven't uh, if you haven't got the whole tooth. I said I don't think that's entirely true. Are you calling me a liar? I always tell the truth. I said no, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm saying that you're wrong in drawing the conclusion that because we can't see the whole tooth, we can't reach a recommendation on what to do about it. The thing about these patients is, you know, if you've been doing the job th over 30 years, you've, you've seen a few of them, you know, and you know the best way to deal with them. And the best way to deal with her was to be quite uh, certain, come to, come to a conclusion and stick to it. Because the minute you say, well, you know, well, what do you think, you know, what would you like to do? What, what did your previous dentist say? That's it. They're like, oh, you know, you can't, one minute you're telling me one thing, one minute you're telling me another thing. I told her, I thought, if it's as painful as she said, <clears throat> bearing in mind that she was five minutes from death because she left the other one too long and she has 
at least one oral surgeon has advised her to have it out, as and when it gives her any serious trouble, that I should refer her to secondary care and have the tooth out. And the irony of the fact that she was near death because of leaving it too long is completely, you know, it's completely whoosh over her head. How did we go on to this? I was supposed to be talking about the private fees guide. Okay. When you get your reminder, don't ignore it. I mean, ignore it. You can ignore it. If it was me, I wouldn't ignore it. If you want to carry on getting these fantastic videos and all the other benefits, then you're going to need to do something. It's going to cost you about 300 quid, which I, when I wasn't working, I used to think was a lot, but now I am working, I realise it's, it's chump change for most of you guys. So don't write in and say, I can't afford 300 quid, because I know you bloody can. When you, when you bear in mind it's a business expense, so you can claim it against tax anyway, which brings it down to about 180. Anyway, that's enough of that. But the point is, your membership is going to expire on the 31st of May if you don't renew. Now, if you've already got a renewing PayPal thing set up, then you're in happy days, you're laughing. When you renew, you'll get a com renewal confirmation, and in the renewal confirmation will be a link to the private fees guide. I'll tell you a bit about the private fees guide. A bit of it went out in an email today, that's the 15th, uh, yesterday for you, because you'll be watching this tomorrow. The uh, fees for the um, fillings and everything, pretty much the same. Uh, extraction's the same. Dentures haven't changed much. Implants have come down a bit. Um, endodontics have gone up quite a bit. The routine checkup has, has gone up because I think uh, a couple of years ago we were all a bit desperate to try and you know keep the volume patient volume up so we put the cost of a checkup down to try and avoid uh, deterring people from attending now it's it's gone the other way the routine stuff's gone up and but the emergency stuff has come down so uh, we're sort of trying not to deter new patients from coming in Endodontics, which I've always thought was a highly underpriced uh, skill, has finally started to go up a bit, which I'm quite pleased about. Because I think endodontics is, if it's done well, it's really good, good general dentistry. You know, you can really, this is you're really saving teeth with endo. Um, what else? Anyway, it's all in the email and the guide, so. When you renew, you'll get the, the link to the guide. You can download the guide and then you can set your fees accordingly. Um, you can renew now. You don't need to wait until the 1st of June. So you'll get a couple of reminders if you don't renew. If you want to, just go to dentalfusion.org and click on your account. And it will tell you when you're a member until and then... Um, you can renew for a year, a year, up to a year, up to a year ahead, if you see what I mean. So, supposing you do uh, expire on the 1st of June, you could renew tomorrow, that is today for you, 16th of May, uh, until the 1st of June 2018. So you don't lose anything by renewing early, do you know what I mean? You don't lose, it's not like you lose a few days if you renew early. It's not like a rail card, oh no. You renew early on your rail card, they take it off. They, they regard your old one as having expired. Bloody Swiss con. But not us. Anyway, And then, but, but the point is, if you renew early, then what will happen is you'll get the renewal confirmation email and it will have the link to the... So, anyway, because most people renew on the 1st of June, almost everybody will have had the link to the... Uh, who's renewed anyway, will have the link to the private fees and wages guide by the 1st of June. But if you're desperate for it and you want it two weeks early, then just go and renew now, and um, and you'll get it. You'll get it as soon as you renew. Um, you know, we were toying with the idea of charging for it because it seems a bit unfair on the dentists who do respond to the survey that they don't get anything really for putting the effort in. But on the other hand. 
the uh, it was always was a benefit of the association so really it was a member benefit and one of the more decent ones so I thought at the end of the day we'll keep it as a member benefit and not and not charge for it because I don't want to be I don't want to get to the point where you know half the members haven't received the private fees guide because it was they didn't contribute to it but it was 25 quid and they've not got round to paying for it or whatever 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 it's just it's too much work to program the website to sell it so we're giving it away as always but do get a copy because as I say it's interesting and while um, you know I mean some people use it to set their fees and other people use it to wave under the patient's nose and point out that their fees are, are less uh, the areas that are going up it's useful to know and the areas that are going down are useful to know as well so you don't get too out of, uh, out of kilter with the um, what's it with the uh, with your fees all right that's it home sweet home i shall talk to you i shall upload this tomorrow so um, i will talk to you all probably wednesday have a good day at work bye good morning good morning good morning Something coming. You know, seat belts are designed to be put on one handed. Do you know that? Oh, the gear sticks are supposed to work. So, anyway, look, this is just a quick addendum because when I go to work today, I'm going to mix together the thing I recorded on the way home from work yesterday when yesterday was today and today was tomorrow and uh, so you'll be getting it today even though it was recorded yesterday <coughs> or tomorrow as promised anyway I thought I'd just do a quick addendum now look you know obviously I'm obsessed with Bitcoin in the same way as people were obsessed with uh, property when property was shooting up in price etc etc can't help it but there's been this big hack big this big malware thing and the uh, they're demanding a ransom in Bitcoin so and a lot of people are saying a lot of things about Bitcoin and most of them are dumb really dumb and it's Bitcoin is a bit of an intelligence test unfortunately that people people find it hard to say anything clever about Bitcoin it's an intelligence test that people fail so I just wanted to give you like a, the inside track on all this so that at your next dinner party you know exactly you know you're gonna say something with it it's not gonna make you look dumb <laughs> all right? okay Bitcoin first of all Bitcoin is a um, money it's a type of money in the same way as the pound is a type of money, lira, euro, you name it, the ruble, they're all monies, okay? Now, to, in order to understand why Bitcoin is money, you have to understand what money is. <clears throat> so the first thing that it, you need to do if you're gonna try and understand Bitcoin seriously, is do a bit of reading, do, do a bit of research into <clears throat> what makes something money. And there are some, you know, there are uh, a lot of sort of uh, predefined uh, measures like, uh, you know, it has to be a, a store of uh, value, it has to be a, a unit of account, you know, you have to be capable of pricing things in it. Every unit of the money has to be the same as every other unit. So, for example, you don't uh, have to worry if someone gives you a five pound note, whether it was previously stolen, stolen from somewhere and therefore the police are going to want it back. Um, you know, so there's all this research, basic research, but you don't need to worry about that. If you just just accept for me, from me for the for the first part, Bitcoin is is a money, okay? And then you say, well, what's the difference between a money and a currency? Well, basically, a currency is just a money that's currently in use. So you know, the uh, Roman sesterce was a money, but it's not a currency because at the moment, obviously, it's not currently in use. 
So that's when they say, is it a currency or a money? Basically, it's a money, but at the moment, it's becoming a currency. Now, obviously, a currency is the more people that accept something and own it and hold it and use it, the more it becomes a currency. So it's a currency in its infancy. Why is it such a good money? People who use it say that it's very, very close to an ideal money. That is like a theoretical academic money. And the reason is that it's um, it's immune, really, from outside interference, and that's what that's that's the essence of what constitutes an ideal money is that you don't have uh, governments waging sort of foreign wars that would you know can only be afforded by running the printing presses and and debasing the currency and. Uh, so that brings you to another point, that inflation is a tax. You know, we have PAYE tax, we have national insurance tax, we have inheritance tax, we have value added tax, and we have inflation tax. And inflation tax is, the, is a, a hidden tax, it's a stealth tax. It's the tax that means that your, um, you know, your endowment that you took out in your 20s, in the knowledge that it well, you'd be rich when it matured, won't buy you a cup of coffee when it matures. And you have to ask yourself, who's who's had all that value? And the answer is that inflation has eroded. They go, oh, inflation has eroded it, but it hasn't. It, well, inflation has eroded it, but the point is that inflation is the tax. It's the tax on any asset that's denominated in whatever currency that's inflated. So Bitcoin was designed to be pretty well inflation free. Um, there, there's a maximum upper limit that everybody knows about on bitcoins of 21 million. Although there are more than enough to go around because they can be infinitely subdivided. So it's almost like a counter inflationary, it's a deflationary currency in that you have it in your bank account and instead of seeing the purchasing power go down, you see the purchasing power of bitcoin go up. So that's why bitcoin has been the best performing money every year except for one since 2010 and it typically doubles in a year and in terms of its purchasing power and really that's a sign not so much of the fact that Bitcoin is becoming worth more although it is because of demand is increasing and supply is fixed but it's, it's a measure really of um, how other currencies are faring against Bitcoin. You know, how is the pound or the, the dollar doing against Bitcoin? And the answer is the pound and the dollar against Bitcoin are doing very badly. Um, and, in, and if you look at your house, which I've said in the past is pretty constant measure of uh, value because it's, it's always the same size, it's still, it still always has a roof and always keeps you dry, etc. If you look at how your the value of your house is doing against your local currency, you'll probably find that your house is doing rather well in terms of purchasing power. You can purchase far more of the local currency with your house than, than uh, was necessary to buy the house in the first place. So, so currencies are doing really badly. <laughs> um, and it's a shame that um, wages aren't wages which are typically dominated in local currency really should be going up um, you know hand over fist like property prices and like the, like the Bitcoin price but anyway we've wandered a bit far away from ransomware ransomware is uh, can be initiated through somebody some idiot opening an email in this case to get infected you don't necessarily have to be the one that opened the email someone on your network has to be the idiot who opened the email but then this thing is not a virus people call it a virus it's not a virus it's called a worm and the difference is a worm is capable of jumping from computer to computer on an internal network um, unlike a virus which has to infect every single computer uh, generally from the internet or from some sort of outside source so once you've got a worm on your network, it'll go around and it, uh, it'll encrypt all your drives. And it encrypts all the drives that have got drive letters. So it'll encrypt drive C, D, F, G, S, whatever you've got. 
um, including any drives that you've got mapped. So if you've got your an external drive that's mapped as a drive letter, then it'll encrypt that. But it's not capable of jumping to anything that begins with a double backslash. So if you've got like a network attached storage, then it won't, uh, it can't encrypt that at the moment. And uh, it uh, took advantage of uh, unpatched computers, basically. So uh, if your computer was up to date and you had Windows 10 with the latest updates installed, then this won't have been a problem. The bad news is that it's pretty thorough, this thing, so it, and it encrypts your files and uh, destroys the key, or rather it sends the key to head office and then destroys it locally. So don't believe anyone who says that they can decrypt your computer if you're affected by it. The only thing you can do is one of two things. Uh, one is to pay the ransom, in which case I think it's highly likely that you will get the key uh, and be able to decrypt your files and it's about $300. Or the other thing is just restore your files from a backup, wipe the computer clean and wipe your, and restore your files from a known good backup, in which case all you've lost is uh, a few days work and you're a bit older and wiser. The uh, program you want to use to back up is a thing called Macrium Reflect, that's M-A-C-R-I-U-M, Macrium Reflect, and it's a free program, very sophisticated, and uh, I might, if there's enough demand, I'll, or if you want me to, I'll can take you through how to set that up. And that, that makes one full backup every month and then every day it just backs up the files, any files that are different. So in order to restore to any particular date in time, you restore the full backup plus the differential backup for that day and then that gets you back to any day. Uh, mine back up in the middle of the night so if I wanted to uh, get you know uh, back to yesterday I just have to restore the nightly backup. Um, if you decide that you want to buy Bitcoin and pay the ransom, that's a bit tricky. You have to know someone who's got some, ideally, and then uh, the best thing to do is just give them the money and ask them to pay. The idea of sort of getting Bitcoin at short notice and then sending it, because this thing's on a timer, it sort of ticks out after a couple of days. So you can't really, um, you can't really do a bit of research find a decent exchange, set up an account, go through the anti-money laundering, and know your customer, hoo-ha, photograph your passport, proof of address, buy the Bitcoin, get it delivered, and then send it to the crooks. Um, that, is, that is tricky. I think they're being a bit optimistic about how many people have got Bitcoin, but why, why do they want payment in Bitcoin? Why? Is that does it suit them so well? You know, why is it always advertised as the currency of the crooks? And the answer is that it's very much like a Swiss bank account. Every Bitcoin is held at an address. And the address is just a string of gobbledygook. Nobody knows who owns it unless they've associated their name and address with their real world identity with that Bitcoin address. So for example, if um, <clears throat> you know, if I had a Swiss bank account and it was just a string of numbers and letters and nobody, nobody would know whose it was. But if I say, uh, you know, I'd like to buy a helicopter and I'm going to pay, I'll be paying out of this account and can you please deliver the helicopter to uh, Angry Towers, then it's a pretty, reasonable suggestion that <clears throat> that Swiss bank account is associated is my Swiss bank account isn't it and it's the same way with Bitcoin addresses if you associate your identity with an address then people can start to join the dots <clears throat> but in practice if you don't uh, if you don't associate your identity with a Bitcoin address then really they have a lot of trouble finding out who owns what and that's why the crooks love it. It's what they call pseudonymous. It's not completely anonymous because the address and its contents and all the transactions are publicly visible and maintained on this shared network of computers. But um, their actual real-world physical identity of the person who's making all those transactions is, 
uh, has to be voluntarily disclosed or disclosed by mistake. Um, so you get this uh, pseudonymous people are sort of using the Bitcoin addresses as a pseudonym. So, but I think it's a mistake to um, dismiss Bitcoin as just a, a crook's currency, you know, or the currency currency designed to just buy we uh, drugs on the dark web or whatever, because in the same way it was a mistake to dismiss the internet as uh, just a way to download pornography in the early days or uh, all new technologies are you no know, the criminals are early adopters <laughs> of promising new technologies especially if the authorities are a bit slow to understand them and catch up so looking at Bitcoin really from a, a money point of view um, you can obviously go into it from an ideological point of view as a, a sort of an ideal money or you can go into it as a safe haven uh, for your you know to get out of holding assets that are denominated in fiat or you can go into it um, you know you can go into it as an investor and say well look I'm looking for a, a return and it's high risk I mean no, nobody's not nobody's not Nobody's denying it's high risk. I mean, the, the one year out of the six that it went down, it went down a lot. Having said that, it's they're currently about it's currently about seventeen hundred, eighteen hundred dollars a coin now. And uh, most of the people who are familiar with the space believe it's got more upside potential than downside potential. You know, it's more likely to end up as two, three thousand dollars a coin in the short term than it is. Two, three hundred. So, and everyone's chasing alpha, aren't they? At the moment, they want to return on their savings. Um, it depends on your, you know, it depends on whether you pass the intelligence test. Are you, you know, do, do you do you take your advice from people at dinner parties? And if they say, oh yeah, I've heard about that Bitcoin, it's a Ponzi scheme. Um, do, do you think, oh well, I won't touch that then? Or do you ask yourself, okay, what are the characteristics of a Ponzi scheme? How can you tell if something's a Ponzi scheme? What would a Ponzi scheme look like? And then look at Bitcoin. Okay, is, does Bitcoin have these characteristics? Does it, uh, you know, does it pass the smell test, the whiff test? Personally, I've uh, I've looked into it in great detail, and I'm. I'm reasonably happy that it's um, it's a breakthrough in computer science. I honestly believe that. And like all breakthroughs, like Skype, like fax, like email, like the internet, uh, all of which I've seen in my lifetime, I'm quite happy to be an early adopter and then just sit back and wait, you know, and just wait till everyone else, <laughs> wait till all the low foreheads catch up. <laughs> but um, yeah, so don't, uh, when you see all these, uh, you know, the, all these articles in the Daily Mirror and the Sun and the Daily Mail, what is Bitcoin and how do you get some? And what is Bitcoin? How do you mine it? You know, created by a mysterious, mysterious programmer, Satoshi Nakamoto. Aha. It's uh, it's open source. All the code is open source, which means that there's no secrecy about how the system works. And anyone who knows how to read computer code can download the code and, and see how it works. So there's nothing shadowy about it. And, and in fact, I don't know, you know, I mean, many of you may be familiar with Linux, the operating system. And most of you will use Windows, obviously, but uh, Linux is another operating system. And um, it's open source. Anyone can install it on their computer and you don't need to worry about whether there's something hidden in it because, unlike Windows, <laughs> because, uh, you know, you can read the code. Anyone who knows how to read code can read the code for Linux and, and say, yeah, okay, that's what I would have written. If I'd written it, that's fine. 
Um, and it was created by this guy called uh, Linus Torvalds. But, the, you know, the idea that he's control, in control of it is just ridiculous because he's, it's, I mean, you know, everybody looks up to him, respects him, and when they make some big decisions, um, you know, his opinion is given slightly greater weight, I would say, than other people. And no more than, than an expert in the particular decision that they're going to make. Um, and, and he may well be less expert than some of the experts in the particular decisions that they're making. Um, so it's a similar system, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's got a life of its own. It exists in its own right as a concept. And uh, like, like Linux and like uh, BitTorrent and all these decentralized protocols, decentralized open source protocols tend to exist on the internet and to shut them down you'd have to shut down the internet and that's not practical so again the other thing that you you know you hear oh well it's too volatile well it's not anymore I mean, it was in the early days or you hear that yeah you're the government's going to shut it down well no it's not because <laughs> to do that the government would have to shut down the internet and they can't do that or they, you know, any more than they could shut down and, and a BitTorrent. And believe me, they've tried to shut down BitTorrent, which is a file sharing service, which people use to sell, uh, share um, um, music and videos and stuff like that. So anyway, that's Bitcoin. With I know, uh, hopefully, if you're bored with Bitcoin, you'll have fast forwarded through all this. And uh, there have been articles on Bitcoin in the magazine in the past, so it's not the first time I've mentioned it, and it probably won't be the last either. Anyway, I'm back at work. I shall might I might put this on the end of the other video, or I might uh, release it as a separate video. We'll see how it goes. You have a nice day at work. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.